Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sean Loring. I'm the CEO and attorney for the Escapees RV Club. And uh, I have the, uh, the distinguished pleasure of introducing, introducing and, uh, and co-hosting with my dear friend and law partner, Susie Adams, uh, on the topic of domicile. Uh, Susie, just to brag about her just a tick, is uh, a licensed Texas attorney with over 40 years of professional experience. She is a partner with me in Loring & Associates, where we primarily handle estate planning, probate, uh, contract disputes, uh, business formations, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, she recently gave a, a full presentation on business. Um, and she has over 20 years of trial experience. So uh, help me welcome Susie Adams to, uh, Hello, to this. Everyone. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's part of, part of doing these things live. I want to remind everybody, um, as we go through this presentation, uh, please feel free to ask questions in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, we'll do our darndest to make sure that we, um, we answer them all. If for some reason, we can't answer your questions. They maybe take too long or involve personal information or whatnot. Please know that we will provide Susie's contact information after this little chat and, uh, and we'll address your questions then. So with that as a backdrop, we're here to talk about all things domicile. And, uh, and jumping right in, um, I, I guess what's, what's on everybody's minds, at least from a preliminary standpoint, Susie, is why should I care about domicile? When, if ever, is it a problem? And, uh, and what the heck is domicile? Well, thank you, Sean, for that introduction. Um, on, uh, we've got some slides today, and we're going to kind of walk through those as we discuss these things. And so the very first one just is, of course, the uh, this is the lecture on domicile. And the next slide is, is telling you all that I'm um, <clears throat> disclaiming anything and everything I say today, as is Sean. We're both lawyers, and we know perfectly well to disclaim. If you think you're getting legal advice today, you're getting really top of the iceberg. And so don't think that you can leave this lecture and know all things domicile, although you might. You never know. As the next slide shows, um, I this is this is pandemic me, what I call pandemic me. It's that the greatest part of this pandemic is that we get to argue from here. So that is exactly how I dressed for court. You know, jeans from waist down and the suit from <laughs> waist suit, up. Suit from, suit from top up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you hope, you know, the judges can't see past that. But um, sure. I just wanted to remind everyone, because of the pandemic, a lot of things, even if you've heard this lecture or this talk before, are going to be different because we've learned a lot through this uh, pandemic. Let's see, I think the next slide is, this is what we're gonna talk about. First right. question is, why do you care? And I think, Sean, you've already um, asked that question. Why do we care? I, there's it's so many- It's people. almost like we rehearsed this. I mean, we didn't, <laughs> but it's almost like we did. <laughs> and and what happens is I'll, I'll have people, and I, I kind of imagine this is what happens, and especially during this pandemic that you're sitting around thinking, I've got to get out of here. We've got to change our life. Let's sell the house, get an RV and take off. And then you two are driving down the road happily in your new RV. And then you look at your driver's license and go, oh, that's the house where we used to live. That's the address on this driver's license. What do we do now? Now I'm assuming most of y'all in this day and age don't do that, that you of course, have Googled all the things you have to do ahead of time. But just in case you're one of those who really spontaneously said, let's get out of here. That's what this is all about. How do you establish that address on your driver's license when you've just sold your house and you're taking your house with you and you're on the road? Okay, so that's, that's a little bit about why you should care about this. And as the slide suggests, 
Uh, rest assured, everybody uh, in, in our audience, you are not normal. If there was any confusion about and, that, you know, dispel those illusions, yeah. you are not normal, right? And, and, and I have people say, I just want to do this by the book. And then I say, if you're choosing this lifestyle, there's no book. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're out you're you're out of the norm and so yeah and so that's why you need to care it's different than if you um have a house you sell it you go to a new place you get a new house you change your driver's license that's considered normal okay, okay so. so if if that's the backdrop of why we should care then um when is it a problem why why is why could this be a problem Great question, Sean. There's many reasons why this could be a problem, beginning with the very next slide. Okay. This particular issue has come up in the case law a lot. It's And it happens a lot in Minnesota. Let's say that you are, have decided to leave Minnesota, you sell your house, you've decided to call Florida your new home. And so um, you, you have nothing left in Minnesota and you go to Florida and you um, try to establish that that's your home. But in fact, you're traveling all over the place. So how do you show both that you left Minnesota and moved to Florida? There's case law concerning people who had a house both in Minnesota and Florida and they had to try to prove that just because we have our house up in Minnesota, our, our domicile is Florida. Now, why would you want your domicile in Florida over Minnesota? Probably because there's a big income tax in Minnesota that you don't have in Florida. So right. then the taxing people in Minnesota say, we don't believe you really moved. You have the burden to prove you moved. So in one case, the man had a house in Minnesota and a house in Florida. His accountant said, be sure and keep a record of how much time you're spending in Minnesota versus Florida. He did that. But every time he was in Florida, he wrote vacationing again in Florida. That kills his case. If you're only vacationing, it's not your home. Another uh, guy. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. F finish your thought. And then I want to address a couple of questions that get, get your thoughts on a couple of questions that are coming in the chat. So. Sorry, I didn't mean to okay. And, okay. Because the other scenario was a guy who also had a house in Minnesota and a house in Florida and Minnesota said, we don't believe you really moved. He said, oh yes, I quit my tennis club in Minnesota and I joined a club, tennis club in Florida. Tax, I mean, the court said, hey, you can't play tennis remotely. You must have moved to Florida. That's now your double. So that's how easy and weird it is. Yeah, ahead, and, and so. I love I love that case uh, because it illustrates a point that as we get further into this uh, this presentation, I know you're going to develop, which is the the courts are given great latitude to consider just about any aspect of your life in determining your domicile. Um, we we have had some questions already coming in. Uh, we we had one from uh, from Morgan Teague. Uh, the question is essentially they've always rented. Um, and they're already considered out of state. Uh, I, I know you're going to get to this later in, in your presentation. There, there was another question asking about the differentials between Dakota, South Dakota, Florida, and Texas. Um, we are going to address those later, but I just wanted to alert you, Susie, that, that those questions are coming. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm not that good at, um, what's that <laughs> called where you do two things at once. So I'll tell you stuff. And then, and then Sean, I'm, I'm really um, hoping that Sean will, you know, alert me if we need to discuss something further as we go along. All right. So when else is it a problem? The next slide, this one's big. And I've had folks say, Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Your health insurance changes with the state that you call home, your domicile. Some folks will call me and they say, look, we're Californians. We want to say become Texans. And first thing I say is, okay, well, you know, you'll have to change your health insurance. And Kaiser is not available in Texas. And sometimes people get such a benefit from that. They basically go, okay, thank you. And hang up. So know that your health insurance goes with you. And even if you've got let's say Blue Cross and you want to move. I, one woman said she wanted to move from Virginia to South Dakota and she checked and sure enough, they had Blue Cross 
both places. It seemed great. She moved the first time she needed um, any health care. Turned out South Dakota's Blue Cross is nowhere near as good as Virginia's. Higher deductibles, nowhere near as good of a plan. So you've got to get into the weeds on this so you won't be surprised. Um, I believe the next slide is... Um, I can't, oh yeah, this one had come, had comes up a lot when people say, why do we have to worry about this? Nobody else has ever had to worry about this. This is, um, Ireland or Scotland. And this is a case out of the 1800s where a man was born in Scotland. Then he went to live as a grown up in London. And while there he married, had a son, and then his wife died. He met another woman, had a second son out of wedlock, and then at some point moved back to Scotland and died. And the court was considering one and only one thing. Where was his domicile when he died? If his domicile was London, then the, the, son, the second son would not inherit because illegitimate sons did not inherit. If it was Scotland, then his second son would inherit. In the end, they determined that his domicile was Scotland, so both of his sons inherited. But we're talking, I mean, basically the late 1700s in the UK, this was already, or whatever they call it, then England. This was in fact what domicile was all about. It goes back forever, at least in uh, the Northern European country. So this isn't something weird and new that America thought of. Let's see the next one. When is it important? If you have an accident, where you live can be very important to whether you get sued, where you get sued, where the venue is, or any kind of lawsuit potentially is partly determinative by your domicile. The next problem, let's see, is um, I'm, you're going to have to prompt me with the next. Yes, where your domicile is the one and only place you can vote. And as you know, this last election, particularly uh, the voting rights became super important. So you only get to vote one place and that's your domicile. So you got to make sure that's, in fact, we had many a person saying, I've got to establish my domicile before the November elections. And with the pandemic and everything that for some, I said, just stay where you've been until after the election. You can't go through all the hoops in time for the election. The next important concern is what if you need a vaccine? For a while, Florida was talking about how they wanted people to show their driver's license to show they were really Floridians before they got the vaccine. And then many a person, I think the Canadian snowbirds in particular said, no, no, we're here for the winter, please vaccinate us. And I think it worked out okay, but guess what? Where your domicile can affect whether or not you can get a vaccine. I don't think that's a problem today. I've just heard that basically everything's opened up, but it potentially could have been. There, and there finally, are some states that there, are there. I'll, I'll, yeah, there's there's a there's a few states that that have some some restrictions. Uh, what we've been advising people to to do is con just consider their travel plans. You know, if you if you're moving around the country and you're trying to get the vaccine, I know it's a little off topic from from domicile. Just be mindful that you might be moving in or out of a state that that has a, a vaccine restriction or residency requirement. And also bear in mind, if it's a two shot system that you're getting, you have to have your travel plans accommodate that you'll be in an area to get that second shot. So, Which and it does turn out to be a domicile issue. I mean, again, it's if yeah. um, if and then the final one that's come up lately is on unemployment. An uh, interesting issue comes up if you're, let's say you are um, a, uh, not a solo practitioner, but a person, you're just in business for yourself. For the first time ever, you could collect unemployment during this pandemic, but you had to collect it from the state where you were last employed. And so again, how do you show where you're employed if you are an independent contractor? Well, let's mm -hmm. say the state is South Dakota and that's where your address is. That's where your 1099s were sent. That's where, you know, that's the place you were employed when unemployment happened. Well, then your unemployment would be based on whatever the unemployment rate was for South Dakota. 
Uh, so again, it's important. This domicile isn't just some silly thing people created out of what my dad used to say, whole cloth, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's super important on super important parts of our lives. Sure, sure. Um, okay, well, that, that makes sense. We've, we've talked a little bit of, about why you should care about this and when is a, what is it a problem. Let's really dig in now and uh, and maybe take a look at what domicile actually is. And by the and, way, for, for everybody else's edification, what we're going to do is pivot from what is domicile to how do you establish a domicile to an examination of key states that RVers tend to pick. So I know a lot of questions in the in the chat are are about those uh, topics. We're getting there. <laughs> yes. Okay. So yeah, what is domicile? Why is this so complicated? Well, it's defined as the place you intend to call home. And anything in law where the word intention is mentioned means that it's it's going to be a case law uh, situation. It's not like you can go to a statute and if you do these five things, you are domiciled there. It doesn't work like that. You have to show that you intend to make that place your home. How do you do that when you're taking your home with you? That's a big question. So maybe you've got several residences around the country. Like people say, I, I give the example of, um, of when uh, Dick Cheney announced that he was gonna be George W. Bush's uh, running mate and the constitution said your president and your vice president can't come from the same state. At that point, they were both Texans and then Dick Cheney said, I'm now a Wyoming. That's all he said, basically. And then his staff got everything moved to Wyoming. Well, he happened to have a second home in Wyoming. He told the world his intent that Wyoming was now his home. And next thing you knew, he was a vice president from another state. So it, it, you can do it as long as you have several re residences. You just choose one as your domicile, and then you show the world that, that in, you intend to make that place your home. If you're a full-time RVer, again, though, the intention has to come from, okay, we're traveling all over, but we're always coming back to this place. This is our hub. This is our home. Let's see, what's the elements? Um, these are basically the same thing I've just said, that this, your, this place is where you're gonna call home. And I think I've already said about that, you can have more than one domicile, but only one home. And there we are, a nice couple thinking, oh my goodness, look at our home, we're in the middle of nowhere. And people have told me, I don't want any place to be my home, I just wanna be free. And that's fine as long as you don't wanna drive, you don't wanna vote, you don't wanna be on any property, it, you, you can't be completely free and be alive, honestly. You got to have some connection to the world around you. Okay, the next slide. Um, I think we can go on from there to change your domicile. Okay, so so now let's say that you've you've sold that house. Let's do it this time. Let's say you sold a house in Illinois and you've decided Texas is going to be your home. Okay, you got to do two things. You've got to actually extricate yourself from Illinois and bring yourself to Texas. And that means in all ways. So first step, like these folks in this picture, you have a picture of yourself selling your, let's say, home in Illinois. Okay, the next step is basically, okay, we're out of Illinois, we're into Texas. So make sure and do all the steps necessary to show you've left Illinois, you've come to Texas. Let's see what those are. Oh, I am saying Illinois. Okay, so keep going on these slides a little bit. Uh, yeah, so even the silly stuff, like having the picture of your child in front of a Texas sign, isn't a bad idea. Buying boots, buying the hat, you know, anything saying y'all instead of you guys. I mean, that kind of stuff really does help show the world, this is really my home. Um, what, Sean? <laughs> it meaning like how how all y'all doing? Yeah, how y'all? Plural of how y'all doing? Yeah. <laughs> and hey, having I came gone from to California, I had to learn Texasisms. You know, they, they gave me a book when I crossed the state lines. And um, then, and I went to college in Illinois and California and learned the hard way how silly we sound as Texans when we leave the state. So, so yeah, so that's part of it. Let's see where we are in the process because I think we're. At yeah, establishing I think, I think, 
Right. I was just going to say, you know, you talked a little bit about what is domicile. You talked about concepts like intent and leaving the state, making affirmative steps to join the new state. Okay. Well, what factors are, are commonly evaluated? And I will, I'll ask, uh, as you go through this, a uh, couple of questions. Um, there's, there's people who are asking about what about the real ID act and, you know, you know, having state IDs that are that are compliant that way, um, and then it, there's a, a question about uh, what effect will domicile have on social security income? You know, especially if you're not changing banking systems and such. So as you go through uh -huh. dom establishing <clears throat> domicile, a couple of contemplations there. Okay, and so we're going to go through the steps. And I did see um, one. I happened to look over at one question. So let's start with establishing the domicile. Okay, what's okay. the first thing you need to do is actually, um, okay, these are sort of more of the intent part, I'm uh, where you're basically telling the world, I intend to make Texas my new home, and that's back to showing steps. But let's go through these, because um, I want to get to the paper trail part. Now, again, we're going to go into detail about this. How do you establish your domicile? I'll tell you the actual paper trail steps go ahead to the next. Um, and then the fact that after you do what we call the easy part, then we need you to also create uh, connections to the new state. I mean, real connections, like join local clubs, et cetera, and to say, look, I know we're traveling all over, but Texas is our home and here's, here's how we show it. Let's see what the next state, the, okay, so here we go. This is what we call the 10 commandments of domicile and they are in order in terms of at least Texas. Okay, so now you're gonna be compared to a person who says, say, sells their house in, we'll say Colorado this time, and moves to Texas and buys a house. So what's the first thing that would happen in the real world if you weren't bringing your house with you, you'd have a new address in Texas. So that's the first step, get your new address. I've, I noticed a question someone asked, should I sell the house before changing my domicile? And I'll tell you a scary story about that. It depends on which state you're coming from. But in some states, if you sell your house after you've become, say, a Texan, um, you may actually be hit with a foreign sales tax. Now I'll give you the example. There was a couple in Maryland, they put their house on the market and then their plan was to come down to Texas and go ahead and do all these steps, become Texans. And then when the house closed, they were going to go back up to Maryland and, you know, go through the closing process. Well, the house sold really quickly. And so they, at closing, they still had their Maryland address on their driver's license. And when they showed that to the realtor, the realtor knew their plan. And she said, oh, okay, so you're still uh, um, Marylanders. And I said, yeah, he, they said, had they become Texans before they sold that property, they would have owed 45,000 extra in what's called foreign ownership of property tax. Half the mm. states have it. Indiana gives you a year to sell after you move, but foreign does not mean out of country, it means out of state. So be sure and check that before you decide when to make your move. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's wise. Yeah, there, there are tax considerations uh, with this. Now, Susie and I are not tax consultants, we're not tax professionals. So if you're contemplating things of that nature, you know, please make sure you're working with the, the appropriate tax professional. Um, I wanted to say one thing about this, this factor list. This, this is one of those those uh, key slides in this presentation uh, that and we're going to go through every one of these in the next 10 yeah right All right um, but this is this is in no way an exhaustive list I mean uh, Susie correct me if I'm wrong um, you were mentioning about the case with the Texas um, not the Texas the um, the tennis club and how mm -hmm. a court can look at your your tennis club membership to determine your domicile. I think there's a, another case, again, correct me if I'm wrong, where there's uh, uh, the court looked at, uh, they examined where the person had their fishing and hunting licenses. I think this, the Sanchez case, they were, they were looking at things like that. So, well, yeah, right the on, Sanchez. 
the Sanchez case is uh, scary because basically those folks sold their house in Minnesota, went to South Dakota, went through the steps to become South Dakotans, and then didn't go back to either state for the next year and a half. Wow. And Minnesota came after him and said, we don't believe you're really, you really moved, prove it. And they said, yeah, we have nothing left in Minnesota. And they said, yeah, but what did you establish in South Dakota? Being there for a few days isn't establishing a domicile. They lost. They had to pay back taxes plus right. penalties, interest, all that kind of stuff. So right. and, you got to be got a question on this topic, by the way. Uh, Mark Mark Harrison had asked, you know, how much, how long must you physically reside in your new domicile state? And Florida is their case uh, to to make it legal for taxes, etc. Yeah, and it's and it's different. I mean, domicile wise, <clears throat> one of the things that make Texas, Florida, and South Dakota so attractive is you don't have to spend any amount of time there to claim it as your domicile. I mean, South Dakota, they basically say, come into town, you know, rent a hotel room and go become a South Dakota the next day. That's not the problem. The problem is the state you came from when they say you didn't establish a domicile just by going there and filling out a few papers. That's not enough. And that's where the court cases are. It's not enough to just do the minimum that the state that you're trying to become a domiciled in that all they need you to do. Other states, though, like Oregon, they go to great trouble to make sure you do go through many a hoop before you become an Oregonian. So it's not right. just show up on Friday and by Monday you're an Oregonian. So you got to look at the state you're trying to become domiciled in. And, and that might be a, a really nice lead in back to the to the factor analysis that that we've we've strayed from. Uh, but there there are there are state. It's about telling the the best story that you can. You know, mm -hmm. you, you heard Susie just say it, it's not the minimum standard. You want to you want to overshoot this pictures of your kids in front of the signs tennis club memberships etc but coming back to these factors again it didn't, you know in the interest of time I didn't want to derail you uh tell us a little bit about mail services yeah and so there by the way is a question about about that sorry uh is one of the questions was is, is there any issues of continuing to use a, a mail forwarding service after you've moved away from you know, using it for domicile purposes. Yeah, and, and let's just start on that next slide, which is mail service. Okay, so so here, of course, we're gonna, this is obviously a plug for escapees, um, um, but, <laughs> but basically escapees, if I'm not wrong, Sean, it started purely as a mail forwarding service, not as a domicile creator. I understand it. I mean, back when the family, the family that started the escapees first hit the road, they right. just sort of said, Hey, how can we get our mail? And that became the mail forwarding service. That is now what the largest private mail forwarding service in the world, right, Sean? Uh, certainly in the country. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so, so, so to the question, Hey, can my home, I think there's one question, can my home be Washington, but I can still use the mail service. Absolutely. The mail service is to help you if you're a traveler, you know, get your mail wherever you go. It's not necessarily uh, just for domicile purposes. It can be used for domicile, but it can also just strictly be used for mail forwarding. Yeah, perfect. Um, nope. Why is it your primary connection? Why is it the jumping off point of a domicile story? Yeah, I'm, in, in my book, it, it appears that, again, you're being compared to the people who sell their house in one place and move to the next place. That you, without that address, you can't register your vehicles, you can't get your driver's license, you can't sign up to vote. So you've got to have a place that the state recognizes as a legitimate address for those purposes. Sure. And, and so that's why it's got to be step one. It's as if, oh, here's my new home in Livingston, Texas, here's my new address. And right. so then, it, then it, oh, no, it, it, that makes that makes perfect sense. You you have to have that, that address, as you were just saying, to get all those important state documents, driver license, voter registration, vehicle registration. And those are the by the way, the, those are the easy to, to check. Yeah. Domicile factor. Show me yeah. your driver's license. Show me your vehicle registration. You know, it's not not a big investigation there. 
Right. And so the next slide, in fact, is the next step in Texas. The next step in Texas, you get your vehicles registered before you get your driver's license. So step one, you have your new address. Step two, you get your vehicles registered. And if you're a full-time RVer, we highly recommend that you come to Livingston, Texas to register your vehicles because they know who you are. Escapees headquarters for 40 years, the women who work at registration, super kind, ask me to ask anyone who has any questions, just call them up. They actually answer the phone and answer your questions about how do you register. Now you can't register the vehicles unless you first make sure they've been insured and inspect it. So those two steps, because when you go to register a vehicle, you have to show proof of insurance in Texas and also um, proof that they've been inspected. And then what's the next step? The next step, once you get your vehicles registered, then again, right in Livingston on down the street from um, where you've just gotten your vehicles registered is where you get your driver's license. So you would turn in the driver's license from the state you come from and then go through, depending on what kind of license you're getting, the process to get your new license in Texas. Before the pandemic, you could do these things in one to two days. Um, during this pandemic, it's, I think they're still scheduling appointments for driver's license. I think it's easing up now, but, but you can't just kind of come into town and get these things done as quickly as you could. And if your rig weighs, what, over 26,000 pounds, in Texas, you have to get a non-commercial CDC. So you've got to take a, a test. The joke is if you can just drive your RV and not hit the curb when you turn a corner, you'll pass the test. <laughs> I don't know if it's true, but- I'll um, fail that <laughs> test every time. <laughs> or as one person suggested to me, he's just going to borrow somebody smaller uh, yeah, right. RV <laughs> don't for do the that. test. Don't do that. <laughs> no. Okay. So then once you've got the driver's license and voter registrations easy, um, the we also have something called the affidavit of domicile that we have that you can fill out. We fill it out actually for you, charge a bit for it, but and we file that with the court. And it basically says, I swear Livingston, Texas is my new home. And that helps show, look, I'm willing to commit perjury if I'm wrong about this. So it, it, it's kind of a belt and suspender way to say I'm a Texan now. Now those yeah. are what we call the easy steps. You know, you can do those things in a couple of days. The other half of this are what we ask you to please take some time to do. So what else will help you establish, let's say Texas as your new home. One of those steps is, um, let's see, I have wills down there. I know they're right there for some reason establishing. Okay. So if, if Texas is your new home, if Livingston, Texas is your new home, then when you die, your will will be probated in Livingston, Texas. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next. Uh, okay. This is my just two or three slides where I, I, I start by saying, look, if you hate your family, don't have a will. <laughs> because I mean, having a will, having powers of attorney, that's like if you're in an accident and you can't, you're alive, but in a coma and somebody needs to step into your life for medical, making medical decisions for you or for financial decisions, have these documents created in the state you're calling home. Or if you've already, I mean, make sure you have these documents. If you don't have them, it's, it's horrible. The worst call we get is mom's in a coma and nobody has power of attorney. It's super expensive if that happens. So please do this. Please do this. Wherever you are, please put that at the top of your list. If you don't yet have those uh, documents in place. Okay. Then the next slide, I think after this, yeah, go on, keep going, uh, Brandon. Yeah, these are just our plug, because we do wills in our office, that's part of the reason. If you don't have these in place, then the state will take over and determine where your stuff goes when you die. Mm -hmm. Okay, when should you do this? If you're over the age of 18, you can have a will. So do it tomorrow. 55% of Americans don't have them. I can promise you, there's so many people who tell me 
I wish, wish, wish Dad had just gotten around to this. So, so please. So what, just, once again, it's not a shameless plug for for your services, but if it was, it would look like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Gotcha. All right. gotcha. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good. That's very good. I like that. All right. Next yeah, uh, slide. I do want to. I do want to note something uh, uh, about about that. Uh, and there there have been some other questions about about mail forwarding services and whatnot. Uh, it is pop. Uh, we we do have satellite locations in the Escapees mail forwarding service in South Dakota and in Florida. And there's some questions coming in about the order of operations uh, on these factors. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the order of operations, uh, the, the factors are still sound state to state. A Little bit of difference maybe in the order of operations and they can call you separately to, to discuss those, is that fair? That's right. Fair to say. Yeah, okay. yeah, Texas, I know backwards and forwards. I think Florida, you may do driver's license before registering vehicles. South Dakota, I think that's the same, but but each state, uh, yeah, but this is the order for Texas, but it's whatever it is, it's just gonna be one or two of these kind of different, but that's all. So let's see, what's the next one? Um, the next slide, oh, good. Okay, all right, this is back to, you notice I put a tennis court down here on this picture to remind you again, spend some time in that state you're calling home. If you choose South Dakota, then learn everything you can about the Badlands or Custer's Last Stand. Go watch <laughs> Little Big Man. Something. I mean, and I did. I had one woman who told me that her she thought her great 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 grandfather fought at Custer's Last Stand. I was like, thank you. That's a reason to call South Dakota home. If you say to me, I want to call South Dakota home so I never have to come back to the state, then like that's when my hair flies up. Not a yeah. good answer. Right. I mean, you know, we're, we are a mobile population. We, we travel, you know, it, it just makes, make this part of your travels, make it part of your story arc of, of the routes that you plan around the country. Stop in every once in a while. And take pictures you know? and get yeah. a library card and, and join, local and join a clubs. tennis club. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a tennis player, though. That's why it's yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is, just make Chambers this plugs all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever it is, just make sure that if anybody were to question you, you know, about right. well, you pro prove to us right. this is really your home. You just got well here, here you go. Here's all the reasons why it's home. So let's see what the next one is. Uh physical presence. Then yeah, make as we've talked about. This is where your doctors are going to be. This is where your veterinarians are. If I have people who tell me, okay, I want to make Texas my home, but I always want to go back to say the Mayo Clinic. And because mm -hmm. I have a specialist there, that's fine. But if you say, I want to become a Texan, but I've got to go see my doctors every three months back in Illinois, it's like, well, it's going to undermine your proof that you're really becoming a Texan yes. if you're still connected that strongly to professionals in your old state. So, and it's, it's something <clears throat> to consider as to whether you really want to make a new state your home. If you've got real good connections back home, might not be the best plan to change your domicile. Okay. What's the next one? Yeah. Your social connections. Um, uh, both Sean and I have been members of the Rotary Club. So that's the example I use. If you're a Rotary Club back home, join the Rotary Club here. I think Sean, you mentioned the gun, Club, whatever it is, join the local group. That's where's your hunting license? Where's this? Where's that? Just show that it all kind of lines up in your new state. And then the last one is where'd you keep the stuff that doesn't fit in your RV? I honestly, I have calls where people go, I don't want to be a Californian anymore. I want to be a Texan. I say, okay, what do you have in California? Well, we still have two condos, three boats, you know, to, I mean, you're, you're kind of like in, in four storage units. And it's like, well, no, I think it's going to be hard to prove you're a Texan when you've got so much back home. So again, look at where your stuff is. Uh, the, I think the happiest people I talk to are the ones when I say, where'd you put all that stuff that wouldn't fit in your RV? They said, we got rid of it all. Happy. Are, are you happy, trying happy. to suggest that people are not traveling with their grandmother's antique hutch? <laughs> like strapped to the saying. roof of the RV is just yeah. you know a, a China well, China dinette set or something. 
Well, I know I had at least one couple who told me we just loaded the RV with everything we couldn't yet figure out what to do with. And they made a plan that each each they'd go through a box a week and get rid of stuff. So hopefully That's right. now you know, maybe, and they, hopefully and they kept it right under twenty six thousand pounds, right? <laughs> yeah. They, yes. they had everything they owned crammed in and they threw out a box a week, but it was right under twenty six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yes. That's great. They put up remember smart way. <laughs> You know, get, get yes. your vehicle weighed because of your tires, etc. <laughs> yes, and that's right there at Escapee's headquarters. Yeah, yeah, so it's one of our one of our services. We're happy to weigh uh, your, your grandmother's antique hutch for you. <laughs> All right, let's see what's All next. Right, let's, uh, okay, so we, we talked about the the factors. Okay, yep. so this is the this is the question that comes up. It's come up a couple of times in in this uh, in the chat room already. <laughs> Where pray tell should I domicile? And, and I'll tell you, part of my job is I take calls five days a week, um, at least, oh, well, I don't know, a lot of calls. <laughs> and, and, and this is part of what we were telling you today, that if you want to call with your specific situation, feel free that it's a free call. You know, we just kind of go through it together. But when somebody calls me and says, where should I domicile it's kind of like i i connote it to me being asked how long's a rope yeah i don't you know there's i we can't or, or let me or that. let me tell you what your favorite food is i'll tell you what your favorite food is yeah. <laughs> it's incredibly personal really domicile is incredibly personal because it, of the factors involved exactly so so uh, so then i'll go through with you your factors and then we'll, and uh, many times right in the middle of the call, they'll go, oh my goodness, I just figured out where we're going to domicile. Or sometimes it's like, you know, we're not ready yet to, to choose. We'll just keep an address back home until we do some more looking. So, but here's some of the things to consider. Uh, the first one, ease of dealing with the state. Now this, let's see the next, I think the next slide will talk about that. Okay. We've already talked about it. Why Texas, Florida, South Dakota are so nice, partly is because it's very easy to do things like register your vehicle, get your driver's license, vote. The next one, though, jury summons. Wherever mm -hmm. you call home, you'll get a jury summons from time to time. And they'll say, we want you to show up and be on a jury. If you're in Livingston, Texas, and you get a summons and you're up in Alaska, you just call the number and you tell the court coordinator or the district clerk that you're not available and they will say, Oh, are you an escapee? And when you say yes, they'll say, okay, we'll just take you off the list, but why don't you contact us next time you're in the area and we'll let you be on a jury. Now right. that's, and that's particular. That's really particular to, to areas where the escapees has a, a, a firm presence. And we, you know, we're a known quantity in those, in those counties. Um, well, but I heard that Florida is not so good for at Bushnell. You get one free pass, and then the next time you're supposed to show up. Sure, there's there's some nuances there, but you know, there there again, in, yeah, they they understand that we're not right around the corner. So, yeah, maybe they'll defer yeah. you a little bit. But um, um, yes. there was a there were a couple of questions that that I I think we you, you may want to address before we we move further. Um, one question is is proving domicile a one-time thing or it is or is it every year and a second question is uh, so I, I answer that one and then I'll, I'll ask you another one and we can pursue through okay i think the most difficult year is that first year kind of usually what i go through is a little um okay let's say that you leave uh california in june of this year and so that means June 2021, you left California. And then when you apply, when you do taxes in June or in April 2022, that's the first time California will know that you left the state, probably. So that gives you a lot of time in there to kind of work out some of these details. But that first year, the second year, those are the years that, where it really matters. On the other hand, there's a Supreme Court case where they've been dogging this guy. California taxing authorities had been trying to prove this guy who was living in Nevada, Nevada really owed taxes back in California. They'd been, actually that case had been 
through the courts for 25 years. So if you're big enough and you have enough money and they have the will to keep fighting, you might have to fight it much longer than just one year. Sure. Um, the other the other question that I wanted to uh, to posit to you, because uh, we're, we're about to talk about what state should I domicile in. Um, am I, if I'm establishing a new domicile, am I making a, a connection at the state level or is it really more county specific? Some Most of it is is state level. <clears throat> it's not like you have to go show that, I mean, Livingston, for example, you don't have to do everything there, but just show that this is the state you come back to on a regular basis. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't, you can go to El Paso instead of Livingston, but just show some presence in the state. Um, let's see, where are we? Because yeah. it looks like uh, we're, we're, we're going to out of time. We're about 10, 10 minute time. So uh, folks, if you're asking questions, I see there's a lot of really thoughtful questions. Uh, please know that Susie will be available after via email, via personal phone calls to address questions. Um, Hi, Linda. Um, and OK, so let's go down, though, because I do want to go through some of these other um, some of these other slides pretty quickly. And just to give you a sense. OK, this one in particular, this I put this together several years ago. It may not still be where, you know, which states have state income tax, which ones have sales and um, use tax. I know everybody's told me Oregon doesn't have a sales tax. So that's part of the reason they want to move to Oregon. Texas has a big sales tax and property tax, but no income tax, you know. And, and so each of these, look at this when you're trying to pick your new state, make sure you look at nah, what do these each state have that might help you. So let's go to the next one, uh, sales and use tax. The next one, estate tax, go one more slide. Yeah. Now estate tax can be an issue if it, the way it works, if you inherit versus where you die, like Texas has no estate tax. And so if you die in Texas, even if you're inheriting in California, you I don't think California has an inheritance tax. So therefore, you get it with no strings attached, whatever you inherit here. But those things become important. You know, it's like how far in the weeds you want to go. This is what you can find out. Uh, let's go to the next one pretty quickly. We got taxes and then insurance. We've talked about it, but make sure before you make the jump to a new state that you understand what vehicle insurance, how much it costs, what it covers. Some people are surprised that Livingston is pretty expensive on vehicle insurance and talking to our late, our local state farm guys, they say, well, cause there's a lot of texting going on while driving. I don't know what it is, but that's one of the reasons again, health insurance also changes. I've had people tell me, that with Medicare, the supplementals may change even if you switch counties. So if you say where <clears throat> one woman told me she had a supplemental out of Harris County, which is Houston, she wanted to come up and become um, Livingston domicile, but found out she'd lose her supplemental. So be looking at that stuff before you make this change. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, oh, I'm throwing this in, it's that real quickly, um, the, the one, the last slide, or it's okay. This one is again, uh, the same thing. Look at how, if you come from a state where, um, you've got more of the personal property tax versus, you know, personal property tax is definitely not a Texas thing. So again, just look at some states make every year you have to pay on your RV, a uh, personal property tax. Look at if you've got a community property state, all those things become important. Let's go to the next one. There's, uh, I want to, I want to jump in there on on that asset protection because I know there's a lot of dialogue from a lot of different sources about domicile, and one thing that people sort of overlook is asset protection. Okay, you sell sticks and bricks home, you buy an RV, you're you're endeavoring to to essentially put a lot of your net worth and drive it down the road, uh, and and let's say you hit someone, you know. What are you liable for? Should be a consideration uh, in your domicile analysis. I know you're about to go through the the analysis and the spreadsheets and whatnot, but I just want to alert everybody. Think about that. Okay, I don't want to scare anyone. Many, many generations, many hundreds of thousands of RVing families have RVed full time successfully over the the many decades. You can too. Okay, but I just want put that out on your radar. You know, 
What are you protected? How are you protected? And there's ways you can protect assets. Yeah, and we that's a plug too. We do um, create LLCs and trust and what else do we need for asset protection? Of course, insurance is always important. Um, and I do skip over it usually because I know that Sean will pick it up. Thank you, Sean. You're welcome. <laughs> all right. Bye. All the time, I'm constantly telling people to, this is what I want you to do. When you're trying to decide where to domicile, create a spreadsheet. Now, the spreadsheet's going to be specific to you, but have it with the different states you think where you might want to call home and then put the factors in it that are important to you and then see which state falls out. And I can't believe it, but in the last month, one of the people who called me actually had created the spreadsheet. So I got his permission to put it here. It's, it's, I mean for it to be kind of blurred because it's, it's of course only his plan, but this is one way to help you figure out what the perfect state for you might be if you're ready to um, hit the road and change that domicile. And of course we hope it's Texas and that you'll come to our office um, and what else that you'll get your wills done. You'll create a new company there that we can help you with. What else? <laughs> what all those shameless plug things we'd like to throw in at this point. <laughs> right. right. Let's see. Um, what else? Is there any more? Yeah, that's it. This, this that's is, this is the recap. This, this is what you, you talked about today. Why should I care? When is it a problem? What is domicile? And you went through the general principles and sequence of events. And then we went into, or you went into how to establish a domicile. So if you recall, there were the, the 10 factors, 10 most common factors, not an exhaustive list. Courts are empowered to look at anything they want in your life in order to, to ascertain where your domicile is. So it is about telling a good story, right? It's about, about making sure that you're on, your connections are, are ongoing. You've got a, a bit of work to do, as Susie said, in the first year. But... Make sure you've got those ongoing connections. Um, and then uh, you ended up with where should I domicile? It being a very personal decision, but you went through, uh, you know, the ease of dealing with the state, taxes, insurance, asset protection, a myriad of different factors that should be, you know, or commonly are in people's analysis of, of their st states. So uh, I think the next slide has your, your final thoughts. It may, I think it just says, are there any questions, but my, but I really, oh yeah, here it is. That's my, the mantra, leave the state you're going from, enter the state you've decided to call home and establish yourself there. But um, part of it is, this is a process. Uh, I've had people who call and say, you know, I just need to figure all this out ahead of time. You're not going to figure it out ahead of time. It's, it's a process. It's, it's, it's uh, so don't to so go ahead and you're, you're choosing a new lifestyle. You know, that's the fun of it. But let this be part of that journey instead of some horrible obstacle you have to get over. It's just it's just part of the fun. And 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 yeah. we're here and we like I said, I talk to people every day of the week. I love hearing from you all. I love I get vicarious pleasure out of all the great place, places y'all are going while I'm I'm not stuck in Livingston. Exactly, but, but it does feel nice to be able to interact with people through these calls. Well, and and I, yeah, it's it's a uh, there's it's a very nice service that that you provide. Uh, you know, I know that you, you do this as a favor to the Escapees RV Club, and so you know, on behalf of the Escapees, we we appreciate it. I do want to note that the consultations, the phone calls that that Susie is talking about, are free. Okay, so she will yeah. give you you know some of her time. That's the phone number. Uh, I will warn you, <laughs> Susie, as you can tell by the chat uh, alone, uh, tends to get a lot of questions. And so she tends to book out many, many weeks in advance. Uh, so, you know, there, there were a lot of questions, Susie, that, that just kind of floated on by. Um, one question was, will you provide these slides? Not in a million years. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> no, I and, and that the, hand. One, <laughs> the the one and the one about the um the like the Ten Commandments. I think it's in every article. Yeah. I mean, in fact, and we write for the Escapees magazine. I write every every yeah. two months, yeah. and and you'll notice sometimes I'll write about almost any subject, and somehow the Ten Commandments get in there. 
So yeah. it's like, oh, I'm, I'm short. I need to add a little something. <laughs> and then we go. So they're there for you. Um, we're here to help. We, of course, love this lifestyle. I mean, I think it's great fun to work with you guys. It's a, the best clients. And like Sean said, I've been a lawyer for almost 40 years. I've dealt with all sorts of clients. And this is by far the most fun because you right. know, the ba basic attitude is y'all are out there to um, explore. And post pandemic, I think we're going to see a whole lot more people saying, hey, time to get out there and go. So let us help. Okay, um, I want to note that there there is a replay, folks, so you can watch this again. I know this is a lot to absorb, um, and we went through this material very, very quickly. So in addition to the free consultations, in addition to the, to the magazine, um, as is on the screen, the video will replay immediately after this presentation. So if you didn't absorb everything, take, take some time, you can watch it again. And, and I've, I've noticed questions about, hey, some of those um, print, you know, the, some of the pages got too fast. Part of that is to say this stuff's online. If you want to see where you can save tax money for this or that, just Google it. You'll see that same picture of the United States and they'll show the same pretty places where you can get there. So it, I, I don't own that material. So it, sure. it's out there. Just know to go look at it because it's all there waiting for you to ponder. Yeah. Um, I will field one one question that came up. Can I buy a, a Texas a domicile? Can I domicile in Texas? Excuse me, and buy a residence in Florida? Can, can you have a, a residence in more than one state? Absolutely, <clears throat> but just make sure you can have that residence in Florida. Um, you can claim Texas as your domicile, but make sure you still do those steps to show that Texas is your home. But on the other hand, Florida and Texas don't care. Florida is not going to come after you and say, we don't believe you're really domiciled in Texas. Minnesota might care. California might care. The whole East Coast might care, but not Florida. I mean, Northeast Coast, not Florida or Texas. It's like, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Call Texas home. Call Florida home wherever you want. It's fine with yeah. us. It's just those other states that'll say, uh, uh. so that's where you got to be careful. Thank you, everybody. This is fun. We, I assume we'll see you sometime in the future again, huh? Yeah, we'll see, we'll see you on down the trail. Susie, thank <laughs> you very much for, for your time and your wisdom and guidance. And, uh, and again, folks, there's her email. Uh, you saw the number earlier. Reach out. Yeah, reach out. We're there. Hopefully we can help you with whatever you got, whatever questions.